Some years ago, my brother brought one of the first tape recorders of the time to my childhood home. It was fascinating. That world of cassettes, turning them over, seeing that the tape doesn't get entangled, and we spent hours recording, rewinding, listening, recording, rewinding again. And I remember by that time, with my, what, 10 years of age, I asked one of the most profound observations of my existence. I said to my mom, Mom, the problem of life is that it doesn't have a rewind button. Why? Life is always played forward. It never rewinds. Once something is done, there's no return. And every day, every second, carries its own irrevocability. And I say this, time is our only and undisputable resource that you can't rewind, you can't renew. Where did time go, we ask, when we perceive that we've spent years living our lives in a wrong way? Correct? And the answer is, of course, that time went to the same place it always did. At the end of each day, one more box on that calendar goes from the column of the future to the column of the past, from possibility to history. And all of its moments can be remembered, it can be celebrated, or it can be regretted, but it can never be recovered. Life is one of those games in which you can only move forward. And the meaning of life is that one day, life itself will end. Like we spoke of last Sunday, never will we discover how we should live our lives unless we fully understand the meaning of the fact that one day this is going to end. Some time ago, I read an article that had a title that stuck to me that said, do your commitments do your commitments match your convictions? Convictions have to do with our purpose in life, with our original calling. And commitments are actions or decisions made in the past which links us to a future action. So these commitments determine the shape of our lives. For example, graduating from high school, I don't know, choosing a university, a college, getting married, changing jobs, a career. All of these involve a very dramatic or radical commitment. An advantage of these important commitments is that they're easy to recognize. But not always do we think about the hidden cost of these decisions. Sometimes people buy a huge house which will require their entire life to pay for it. Maybe they might see the size of the purchase, but they don't see the cost of wasting quality time with their family. And by the time they finish paying, the children have already left, and the only thing they have is an empty shelf for two old people they won't ever move from the living room and they have the rest of the house to themselves. But most of the commitments to which we're linked to are usually routine. Maybe they're not that dramatic like buying a house. But routine commitments may seem trivial, but we can't underestimate the power they have in our lives. We don't realize it, and we let them include us in a dozen of WhatsApp groups, <laughs> and we waste hours answering messages and texts to people we don't care about so they don't think that we're rude, or we fill ourselves with things we have to do because others tell us we have to do them. Our mom calls us and says, did you remember it's the birthday of your nephew? Don't forget to call him or make a FaceTime call. They're secret sect that demand less time than moms demand for us calling all the relatives. That's why when we do things and we make a balance of our daily actions, there's a gap in between. 
what we value and the use that we make to our time. The Apostle Paul warns Timothy precisely of this tendency. An old soldier who wants to please his superior gets entangled in civil matters. But it happens without you noticing it. Addictions are also a type of unspoken commitment. There are commitments that are done without us noticing it. One of the discoveries that most surprises recovering addicts is realizing the amount of time their addiction was consuming, whether it be sex, shopping, alcohol, drugs, whatever. These habits steal our lives. And commitments receive most of our attention. But they're the ones that make our lives be wasted because there's so many and because they appear daily, individually, they look small, they look tiny. We don't perceive the gap that begins to grow in between what we say that matters most to us and what we actually are doing with our lives. Meaning, the gap between our convictions and the thousands of commitments that have nothing to do with these convictions. One day, life passes by us, and we fill ourselves with things we don't want to do, but we do them anyway, and we repeat them. These are the, what, the, the weeds of the grass of our lives, they multiply without our permission and they end up just suffocating us. And these commitments that steal our lives are not biodegradable. They stay there, just turning around, just like plastic wrap or those foam type of containers. They spin round and round and it doesn't matter how important, how rich, or how powerful, attractive you might think you are, time waits for no one. Knowing this, that time waits for no one, why do we spend our days immersed in a web of insignificant commitments and affairs? They don't agree with our convictions. We're just trapped in insignificant commitments. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, let us put off all weight and the sin that besets us and patiently run the race that lies ahead. Generally, we only focus on the word sin, but we also need to get rid of that, that fatty issue of life, that garbage that just inflames us. It doesn't even nurture us. It inflames us. We have to make an effort to eliminate those things that fill our lives, but they don't offer us anything to nurture us. It's the gluten of life that just inflames us. It weighs, but it doesn't really feed us. And of course, it exhausts us, it drains us like a vampire. It sucks out all of our energy. And this creates a condition called active inertia. People tend to stick to old commitments, even when those commitments no longer make sense, even when they become, you know, harmful to our welfare, to our soul. I don't know how this happens, but between life and death, the cradle and the grave, we always end up doing things we don't want to. We need to spend our holidays with them because that's what we always do, even though we don't feel like it. And like I once said, and I love this idea, that's why I'm monotematic in this, us. We look at our emotional budget that we're going to invest in our lives, not others. If there are people who make us feel obligated to give affection or attention, then we need to take distance. Remember this, record this. I'm going to tell you this, and I hope you never forget it because it resolved my life. It's one of the greatest axioms and proverbs that I use daily. Never. Never, ever call, write, or talk to someone motivated by guilt. That's not the motor that should guide you to do something. If it's not out of love and it's out of guilt, 
It doesn't work. It drains you. It doesn't help the other person. Neither does it help you. And being emotionally bankrupt for making someone feel good may sound noble, but it's not. So our schedule of commitments begins to fill with things that we do because of guilt, pity, or, in the worst of all cases, people's opinion. We have to learn to remove that feeling of eternal indebtedness with everyone else. I once said, those soulish mortgages that we never finish paying, we're always owing something to someone. And all that continues until we run into a crisis. And in that moment, when misfortune comes, that's when we find time to change, huh? That's where everything just becomes organized. A busy father who never has time for his family suddenly finds out his son is addicted to drugs and that very busy father finds the time trying to look for a treatment clinic in a rehab center. Now he has the time, huh? Or a couple who were too busy to spend time to each other with each other. Suddenly, they find themselves with all the time in the world to find for lawyers, endless hours in court, when their marriage falls apart. A workaholic. Someone who needs to work. All of a sudden, finds 24 hours a day to think about the meaning of life when the doctor's office diagnosis ends up with a little word malignant. And one day, of course, we all are going to face the ultimate crisis. Our earthly life will end and we're going to be in front of God. The story of Jesus about a rich fool is a story of a man who's heading towards a crisis like a sailor who admires right, the, the yacht he has in a couple of meters before falling through the Niagara Falls. If we wait long enough, the crisis will come. The crisis always comes. That's why it's better not to wait for it to come, to rethink the life that we're living. So let me ask you a sincere question. At this stage of our lives, I believe we're friends. Have you ever thought about where you're going to spend your last days on this earth? In what physical place? Because no one knows where or how one will die. But statistically, it's most likely it's going to be in a hospital bed. So it's possible that your final hours may be spent surrounded by gadgets on a cold iron bed with a respirator. And I've been several times on that finish line with many people. That final lap of life. And the pattern hardly varies. So first, I'm going to tell you what never happens in these moments. I'm going to tell you what never, ever, ever, under no concept have I ever heard. I have never heard someone say, Dante, could you bring me my college diploma? I want to die hugging it because I was very happy with this. And I want to die knowing that I'm a doctor. <laughs> No one ever told me, could you bring me some of my money in cash? Here's my card. Take all the cash you can. I wanted to feel it next to my chest as I exhaled my last breath. Never. No one ever said, could you bring me my Tesla? My BMW, my Mercedes Benz, because I want you to wax it, park it in front of the window of the hospital. Because I spent so many great times in that car, I want it to be the last thing I see before I die. No one ever said, could you bring me the latest financial statement from my bank? I want to know how much money I have before I die. I want to have peace of mind. Would you go to my Instagram account and tell me how many likes the last po photo I uploaded with me eating an ice cream? Never. Definitely, those are not the conversations that take place at the end of life. Do you want to know what people really talk about? It doesn't matter if they're evangelical, Catholics, Muslims, Jews, Protestants, fundamentalists, conservatives, Jehovah Witnesses. 
everyone who's in their final station of life, they only talk about two things. You want to know what they are? If they're good or bad with their families, with their children especially, and then if they're ready to meet with God. No one dies an atheist under fire. No one says, I don't care. I'm going to be food for worms. Even an atheist says, could you pray for me, just in case. They don't know what's on the other side of life, but everyone wants to know if they're good with their family and if they're good with God. These are the only conversations in hospital beds. What legacy am I going to leave is the recurring question. I'm asking you today. When we look in the rear view mirror of our lives, are we going to see a legacy that leaves us a deep satisfaction or are we going to see a handful of chaotic days full of things that no one cared about? We have to simplify our life as much as possible. We only have one try in this life. Ladies and gentlemen, no rehearsals here. We need to choose a life with purpose. Because our last stop, like it or not, our last stop, possibly, it doesn't matter where you live, it possibly might be an iron bed with a very thin mattress under a roof that's not yours. And near other similar beds in which strangers lie. Maybe, if, you're, if you have luck, you might be in your own room. But I give you my word of honor. The first thing you're going to ask if you're okay with your family. And if you left a legacy, not even an, an inheritance, a legacy to your children. And then, one thing will matter to you. And the family will also go to second place. Only one thing will matter. Because where you're going, your family can't go with you. You're going to want to know if you're right with God to go home. Imagine if in your tombstone, they put the years you lost with commitments you never wanted to fulfill. You would be amazed. As I was a child, I had an aunt who had a hamster. My father never let me have a hamster. He said it was a domestic rat. Anyways, the hamster would get on this big wheel and run and run, and I would spend my evenings just watching the hamster run on this wheel. The average hamster runs more than 14,000 kilometers on that wheel during its entire life but it's always in the same cage. And the same thing happens when what fills our lives doesn't coincide with our convictions. It's a life of heretic racing, taking us nowhere. Matthew 6.33, the Lord said in Matthew 6.33, but seek first the kingdom of God and its, its righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So the dominant theme is priorities. What is the most important thing for our heart? Well, Jesus has a simple recipe. Put priorities in in their order, and then let everything fall in its place. By doing this, everything else comes organically. All of the things will be added to you. Can it be that simple? <laughs> Could such a simple formula really work? Well, if not, then stop reading the Bible. Have you ever wondered? If everyone lives the same hours a day, why are there people who seem to do more things than others? You know how some people might be saying, how can they do more? They have the same 24 hours. If time could be explained like the monetary unit of achievements, why do some people have more coins than others? I have that, I have that answer. Simplify. They reorder their priorities and they simplify. Do you know what simplifying means? It means to ignore everything that you could do and dedicate yourself to what you must do. 
Leave everything that you could. I'm convinced it's a lot. And focus on what you must. That's the way to link what one does with one's call. So those who dedicate themselves to a small life, it's only because they do a little bit of everything. They're the jack of all trades and master of none. I was reading, I'm always fascinated by the life of Steve Jobs, right? For everything that he left us as inventions and technology. And no one managed to simplify more than Steve Jobs. It says that after his return to Apple in 1997, I believe, he managed to take the company from having 350 products to just four. You know what that means? 350 products? Making 350 and say only four? That means 346, we're not going to do this anymore. <laughs> 346 no's. He focused only on four products. Macs, iPods, iTunes, and iPhones. And they always have a single product as a novelty on their line that moves everything else. You know how something, a new trade always generates a halo effect on the rest? It's like a flagship, which makes it easier for the user to prefer Apple products. If your company doesn't know what's most important, you're going to have to diversify in hundreds of things, but you're never going to be good in any of them. It's like those restaurants, they want to cook a little bit of everything just to attract more customers. They make pupusas for people from El Salvador, choripan for Argentinians, tacos for Mexicans. They're going to have a little bit of everything, but at the end, they're not going to be the best at anything at all. But a gourmet restaurant that specializes in Italian pasta or Argentinian meat or in any seafood attracts exquisite palates, right? And in life, it's exactly the same. In River, I'm going to share some, uh, I don't know if it's private, but I'm going to say it for the first time publicly. In River, and with the pandemic, we have learned to simplify. We have understood that the church cannot go back, at least us. I'm not judging other people's values or decisions or ministries, but we, we come to the conclusion that we cannot go back to what we were because the world will never be the same. It's like pretending after 9-11, that terrible 9-11, pretend to travel like we used to before the terror attacks and to think we're never going to have to take off our shoes, right, for security, or that we can get on a plane without going through a metal detector, it's impossible. The world changed starting from that day on. And the world also changed starting from the pandemic. People changed. So here in River, we have decided, we came to the conclusion, to divide our board in three. In River, I told the entire leadership, we're only going to focus on three things. Three. We divided our board in three. Less than Apple. <laughs> Souls, meaning broken people, the word, the preaching of the word of God, and baptizing people. Souls, the word, and baptizing people. Three things. That's all we're going to do until God changes our command. Until we have to go to God's presence or he comes for us. Other churches are going to be focused on small groups. Congratulations. Consolidation. It has to exist because we're all one body in the multi-grace of God. Others are going to have cell groups, prophetic conferences, concerts. But we're going to focus on three things souls, the word of God, and baptizing people. And people ask us constantly, what other activities are you going to have? Are you going to have meetings for people? In our case, we're not going to have a club for boring people. We're going to be a search squad specialist in rescuing souls, broken people. Not because we're the best at it, but that's because we're called to do that. We're going to specialize ourselves in what we believe we can be good at or effective in. 
And personally, the same thing happens to me. They invite me to have Zoom meetings, to record messages for conferences, send a greeting in audio. And I always respond, I'm not going to do anything else other than what God called me and commissioned me to do. And this isn't because I'm a show-off or prideful. I did the math. I got a calculator. I did the math. And the rest of my life is no longer enough to do a little bit of everything and leave everyone happy. I'm no longer interested trying to look good with someone who I don't know, who doesn't know me either, so they won't say, oh, Dante lost his humility. He didn't accept our invitations. And before you think... <laughs> Some people are going to be thinking, yeah, it's easy for you to simplify because you're Dante Gebel. The question you should really ask yourself is, are you doing it because you're Dante Gebel or are you Dante Gebel because you're doing it? Because we can all simplify our lives. We can all do it. Activity is not always related to productivity. And being busy rarely has to do with an effective life. So, I know that people are capable of doing two things at the same time. But just like computers, we can't focus on both at the same time because our attention goes from one thing to another. We can't drive and text, or we shouldn't, or control a child, take care of a child who is in a bathtub and talk on the cell phone at the same time. Our brain has several channels that don't interfere, but we're not really focused on both activities. Every time we're multitasking, one is happening in the center of our view and the other is in the background. If right now you're listening to this sermon and you're cooking, you're not focusing on the sermon. No, I can do two things at the same time. No, one is in front and the other is in the background. Either your meal is not going to be delicious or you're not paying attention to what God's saying to you. And if God's talking to you through this, this dummy, and meanwhile you're doing something else, texting with a cell phone, it's the same thing as the president calling you to the White House while you're texting, saying, go on, continue, I can do two things at the same time. I'm just answering a text. No. Nope. If we had to go through a cliff on a tightrope, then you would stop talking. That's why when men get lost in the car, as we're driving, the first thing we do is turn down the music. <laughs> I'm lost. We lower the music. Why? I don't know. We have to find an explanation to that. But I believe if we had to explain how to land a plane, we would stop walking. We can do two things at the same time, but we're not effective at both. We all want our surgeon not to be distracted when he operates on us. We don't like to think that as he's cutting us open, he's trying to make a salad. <laughs> or that a plane pilot is sending a text message while taking off. No. We want them to be severely punished if they do something like that. Don't we value our life in the same way? Isn't your assignment and life important to require your concentration? I'm going to say this just once. Whoever has ears, listen, as the Lord said. If you have concentration, people say, I can concentrate. Yeah, but you don't have priorities. You have concentration, but no priorities. You're going to have a lot of excellence, but you're never going to advance. If you have priorities, but you don't concentrate, you know what you have to do, but you're never going to finish it. So what's the most important thing in life? Well, if someone can teach us about this, about what matters in life, that's David's son, Solomon. When you ask yourselves about the deep meaning of life, after reading everything that Jesus said, the second resource is what Solomon said. Solomon constantly searched for that something. And then he recorded his findings, his archaeological findings of the soul in the book of Ecclesiastes. There, you can find 12 chapters of intellectual wrestling about what matters and what doesn't matter in this world. 
It's like he does the hard work. He writes the hard work so you don't have to keep on searching. So stop suffering and read Solomon. His reflection seems offensive sometimes, but they're so brutally sincere. If you want to listen to someone who has been there before, that's Solomon. So sit at the feet of the most wisest man in the world and learn and listen. First, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon mentions physical health. Good health offers you a better quality of life. Without a doubt, if you've always had good health, I'm sure you're taking it for granted. Talk to those who had COVID throughout this season, and they'll tell you what health really means. Breathing freely without any assistance. In Ecclesiastes 1, Solomon gets to the point. Generation goes, generation comes, but the land is always the same. No one remembers the first men, as no one remembers the last. There will be no memory of them among those who will succeed us. So Solomon comes to this conclusion. He says, whether you enjoy fantastic or fragile health, the end is the same for everyone. We will die and the world will continue. Just like we mentioned two Sundays ago in the sermon called The Last Train Home. Then Solomon mentions education. Well, of course, the man was super famous by his wisdom for his dialect. His intellect. No one knew more than him in the world of the 10th century before Christ. He says, I dedicated myself fully to exploring and investigating with wisdom everything that is done under heaven. I began to reflect, and here I am, magnified and with more wisdom than all of my predecessors in Jerusalem. Having experienced wisdom and knowledge, I have dedicated myself to understanding wisdom, but even this is wanting to run after the wind. He used the metaphor of as ridiculous as trying to catch the wind with the, and putting it in a jar. Studying is wanting to chase the wind. I showed this to my mom so I wouldn't have to study anymore. Mom, the wisest man in the world said that studying is like chasing the wind. My mom almost chased me with her broom. Go and study. You're not Solomon. But studying isn't bad. He said it's not going to give you any satisfaction or happiness. So knowledge as a main objective isn't worth it. Education is a means to an end, not an end in itself, right? A title doesn't define you in life. So he says it clearly. Your title doesn't mean anything as an end. It doesn't make you happier. Then, the wise man mentions pleasure. He says, as for pleasures, what good are they for? I wanted to do the test of giving myself to wine. So he tasted every type of wine that exists. And I tried to hold on to unfoolishness. The question is, how much Argentine Malbec do you need to fill the emptiness of your soul? How many social drinkers are empty? Right? Solomon, trying to give us right, a, a list of vanities, he starts to speak of achievements or those who are addicted to work. He talks about workaholics. They have the same disease as alcoholics, only the drug is legal. I carried out great works. I built myself houses. Solomon says, I planted vineyards. I cultivated my own gardens. And in them, I planted all kinds of fruit trees. He didn't build a house. He built several mansions, all luxurious. <laughs> Every time I have to be next to the bed of someone who's about to take their last train, per se, if they have the providence of being conscious, I usually ask them what their regrets are. I don't do it to mortify them, but just to 
understand and obtain knowledge. And they all agree. They say something like, being too busy trying to improve my family's standard of living that I've realized that my children grew up, they left, they emancipated themselves, and I never really got to know them. And now, they're too busy for me. What happens is that some events are presented accompanied by a sense of urgency, a text message, you need to respond now, a very high level cholesterol, you need to lower now. But the call to love is almost never accompanied by urgency. We always say we can procrastinate. Leave it for later. And maybe you missed the opportunity to sit on the floor with your son to play wrestling, watch a children's movie, listening to them tell you how it went at school. You might think, there's going to be time for that. I'm covered in debt. I need to work. And maybe... A long time had already passed since the last time you had a deep conversation with a very good friend. One where you can be yourself without pretending. One that you can open your heart to. You say, yeah, yeah, now that you talk about it, I need to make time for him or her. The thing is, I'm too busy now. Would it bless the heart of your parents? Or one of the two, if... Only one is alive. If you took the time to express the love you have for them, yes, I need to do it. You're right. One of these days I have to see my mom or my dad, but the thing is, I'm too busy. And like that, life passes by. Children leave. Friends get tired of your absence and disappear. And our parents die. Do you think that you can recover things? Do you think that you can recover a moment, rewind the moment, like when you can tell or read a story to your five-year-old son before going to bed? Do you think that a six-year-old birthday party is the same when they have imaginary friends than celebrating your child's birthday when they're 17? Really? Do you think it's the same to go to see your little child play a sport than seeing him play as an adult? Do you really think you can make a pact with God so that time would stop, so that everything that's important would just stay frozen until you're ready to play with your kids? It's not going to happen. You can't put pause on time. You need to have a frequency flight. You need to be focused. Otherwise, you're going to buy the house and you're going to lose the home. You're going to have savings, good credit. Why? Well, just to pay for the food quote that the judge ruled for your children. In social media, you're only going to find people who are going to love you for what you do. In social media, I don't know if they love you. They'll just put like for what you do, for what you say, or what you show. Your children will love you for who you are. Because if you were a bad father, I assure you, you can't fix it by being a good grandfather. It doesn't matter how good of a grandfather you try to be, you lost your only chance to be a father. You can't push rewind. And your children, who are going to see your vain tries to be a good grandfather when you weren't a good father, they're going to know you're a fraud trying to remedy when you're old, what you couldn't do when you were young. So listen, when you play with time, most of the times it's a bet that you're not going to be able to pay. Even if you think you can win, make sure when you go into the casino of life that you can live without that what you could lose. There's a great writer or journalist named Mary Jane Iron. 
pronuncio bien. Iron, I believe. Mary Jane. Mary, Mary Jane. Jane. Who wrote? Who wrote a fabulous poem called "Gift from a Hair Dryer," which is the reflection of a mother as she combs the hair of her seven-year-old daughter after bathing her, right? And um, she says something like this: "Comb and dry, comb and dry," and she thinks, "Soon I won't be able to do this anymore." And the mother knows that soon her beautiful hair will surrender itself to adult hairstyles horribly dyed, suggested by her hairdresser. First be blonde, then be another color, like what happens to most women. And the mom starts to think as she dries the hair, and she thinks, how will her hair be when she's 14? Where's that hair going to be blowing then? And then she's going to be 16 and 18. The mother supposes that boys will love to watch her hair blow. And some of those guys are going to want to feel her hair on their face. Someone's going to marry her and her hair will be perfectly under her veil. And then her hair will be spread out on his pillow. The mom thinks, I detest that idea. And as she's drying her hair, she's thinking, where is that boy now who's a child now? Will he love her? Will he take care of her? The mom ends up concluding they're going to grow old together. Her brown hair will turn gray. The mom will no longer be there. And then she will leave too. And all the tears in the world drowned her eyes just for a second as she turns off the hair dryer. At the same time, she sinks her face into the warm hair and she wants to just freeze the moment so that the weather won't even affect it. But you can't. Ladies and gentlemen, time doesn't give truce to anyone. And just like I said, it has no rewind button. You can see the videos of your kids when they were little, remember, laugh, thousands of times, but you can't relive it. That's why let's continue on with Solomon. He keeps looking for the meaning of life, and obviously he also mentions wealth, because he was a wealthy man. And Solomon says and that he had servants and made servants, he had cattle, He had the best cattle and than anyone in Jerusalem. I piled up gold and silver and treasures that were from kings and provinces. I had male and female singers. I love that. We ignore it, but Solomon says, I got male singers and female singers. You know how many of us can save money to go see a concert? Well, Solomon went and bought the whole band. <laughs> he took the best musicians to give him concerts whenever he wanted. He took Luis Miguel as an employee. He said, Luis, me, come here, Mickey. Huh? And then Solomon also mentioned sex. He says, I enjoyed the delights of men. I formed my own harem. There it is in the Bible. I'm going to see how it feels like to have all the women I can. The Bible records that he acquired 700 wives, 700 who were princesses, and he had 300 concubines. He was married to a thousand women. Easy joke. That means also a thousand mother-in-laws. If making one woman happen is difficult for you, imagine a thousand. It took him three years to spend one night with each one. That is, if he had sex every night. <laughs> three years until he had to go back to the beginning. If one of the wives said, hey, can I see you tonight? He says, I'll see you in three years. All those women made his heart be perverted. 
more sex didn't make him happy. And he says, and I became very great, more than all those who preceded me in Jerusalem. Yeah, for the world standards, he had it all. He was a rock star. He was the Tony Stark of the era. Sympathetic, playboy, philanthropist, multimillionaire, attractive, almost Argentinian. <laughs> Just kidding. And Solomon says, I didn't deny anything to my eyes, no desire. Nor did I deprive my heart from any pleasures. But rather, I enjoyed all of my cares. And I only knew they were all vanity. It was all useless. I considered all the works of my hands, and I saw everything was absurd. Vanity, running after the wind, no profit was made. My beloved, Solomon played by the rules. And the end of his endonistic experiment was a failure. In my opinion, I believe the Bible records Solomon's hedonistic odyssey to avoid wasting our lives in this as he did. Solomon wisely writes in Ecclesiastes 12 these profound words with certain irony, right? And lots of wisdom, of course. Solomon says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember? Before the bad days come. And the years when you say, I cannot find any pleasure in them. He encourages us to serve our Creator before we grow old. And he also writes, because it's incredible when you read the book of Ecclesiastes and the way that he describes aging. He uses metaphors superior than what Gabriel Garcia Marquez wrote, Pablo Coelho, Jorge Luis Borges. He uses metaphors that are very poetic, but at the same time, they're very easy to understand. He says, one day the guardians of the house will tremble. He's describing the elderly who tremble when they walk. And then he says, the men of war will stoop. When their backs start to curve, and that's the way we walk without noticing. And then he adds, the description of aging the grinders will stop because they are so few. The grinders. In Argentina, we say the living room. He's describing the loss of teeth. That's what he's talking about as the years go by. So the moment is going to come when your wife is going to say, I'm going to go brush my teeth. And you're going to say, since you're at it, wash mine. And then Solomon adds, and those who look through the windows will fade away, meaning the eyesight of the elderly people. And that's where we're all going. They start to fade away with cataracts or other diseases. They come with advanced age. Then he says, the doors of the street will be closed. The noise of the windmill will diminish. He starts to talk about the loss of hearing. The birds will lift up their song, says the wise man. But all their songs grow faint. A poetic way of saying, you're deaf. <laughs> you know how the elderly people wake up super early for nothing? They don't sleep a lot, but their sense of hearing diminishes. And finally, there's a hidden pearl, a pearl that very few people see. But whoever reads it with brand new eyes will discover it. It says, and the caper berry will be of no use. Yeah, what Solomon says, what does a caper berry have to do with what he says? Well, why would Solomon speak of this fruit? He's been talking about so many things. Well, the caper berry was used as an aphrodisiac. It was the Viagra of the time. 
In other words, don't expect to get old to focus your life. Start serving the Lord long before your health deteriorates or when you have little energy. Give God everything in the prime of your life. Give Him the best, not the leftovers. If you consider focusing when the caper berries lose their effectiveness, you're too slow. If you're thinking what you're going to do with your life when the caper berry has no effect on you, then you're dead meat. By the way, Solomon ends his experiment with a conclusion as if it were the grand finale. He says, once he finishes his experiment, he says, the end of this matter is that everything has been already heard. Therefore, fear God and fulfill his commandments, because that is all and the only thing for mankind. That's what life is all about. That's the only thing that fills the emptiness of our soul. We need to do what we have to do to simplify our lives as much as possible. Take advantage of today. It's the only thing we have. God knew that his creation needed a new beginning. By knowing our needs, he divided our lifetime into 24-hour time segments. Opportunities to start all over every day. Lamentations 3.22 says, and it reminds us of this new beginning, every morning his goodness is renewed. His faithfulness is great. There's a song that says, his faithfulness is great. Every morning. So if we could live our entire lives again, what would we do differently? I think about this. Well, maybe we could avoid the mistakes that cost us years of suffering. We would choose our friendship in a wise way. We could dodge the potholes that caught us off guard. How many of us would say, hey, I really could use a new opportunity in life. Well, every new day, God gives us another new chance. The Lord says, I'll give you grace every day. Let's start all over again. That is the reason why God gives us life in 24-hour segments. Just like David said in Psalms 30, if there is crying at night, in the morning there will be shouts of joy. So finish each day. End it. Today, go to bed saying, I did everything I could. No doubt, there might have been mistakes, absurd mistakes. Forget them as soon as possible. Tomorrow's a new day. Start it well. With serenity. With so much encouragement that yesterday's mistakes won't even cloud it. There's a story I once told the congregation, and I love to remember it, and I love telling it. I'm going to continue to tell it even when I'm old. Older, at least. <laughs> a man and his family went, had a small farm, and someone bought a gallon of milk, others eggs, others corn, and little by little, the clients end up buying everything that the farm had to sell. And around the evening, a lady came and said to the farmer, can I have eggs? Come back tomorrow. I have no more. That's how it happens on a farm. Chickens can only lay a certain amount of eggs per day. It's not a truck that brings them. Cows only have a certain amount of milk. Tomorrow, there'll be more. The farmer says, I can't lay any more eggs today. That's a phrase that we should put on a frame. I gave all the eggs I had today. Enough. I don't have any more. That's what the chicken would say, right? Or the hen. I have a certain amount of time per day and I can do what I want and focus on my calling. So when the day is over, learn to say, come back tomorrow. I'll have more. Tomorrow, I'll have new energy. You can also say, tomorrow, I'll have more eggs. <laughs> so don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will bring its own problems. Each day has its own problems. Right? Enough. Beloved, this is the most important thing of all. 
I assure you, you will not sink under the burden of today's crisis because God won't allow that to happen. But if today's crisis you add tomorrow's, it will overcome your limit and it will break you. Have you ever tried to carry a lot of bags, supermarket bags, at the same time? I'm sure after cleaning the milk from the sidewalk, you've learned your lesson. Take two trips instead of one. And Jesus tells us to take today's bag and make a new trip tomorrow. But living in present tense is an art. Not anyone can live in present tense. I'm trying to do the math. It's been what? Four, five years, I started to live in present tense. Do you know someone who's never there? Their eyes are always focused on some invisible horizon. You know what? If he doesn't live in present tense, what's it worth to live in tomorrow? I was a fool who missed out on my own events. Today, I put the videos of the Super Classics in River Plate Stadium. Three times I went to River Plate Stadium in Buenos Aires. Boca Juniors, the Obelisk, the Unique Stadium, Vélez, Sarfield. And I missed them all. I wasn't there. You might say, what do you mean you weren't? I saw you. Yeah, I was there, but I was thinking about what was the next step and things to do. And I missed out on enjoying the moment. Have you ever met someone that never lives totally in the present tense? This is how Jesus wants us to live, one day at a time. There's just one reason why God placed us within the moment, locked between the parentheses of both the past and the future. We're in the middle. Both are off limits, past and future, with signs that say, do not pass. The past is closed, and the future is still under construction. But today, you have everything you need. And as your days will be your strength, says Deuteronomy 33, 25. As your days, it will be your strength. People tell me, but I don't know how I'm going to deal with this situation. Look, in no way am I minimizing your crisis. But if something happens, the, mis misfor the worst misfortune, your worst nightmare, the day that happens, don't worry. God will give you the grace and strength for that day. Now, stand in one square at a time. I spent years of my childhood thinking my mom was going to be in a coffin. My mom always said, I'm going to die soon. You're going to take me to my grave. Those were the typical phrases that moms would say just so that you would behave. But I was always imagining her dead. And instead of enjoying my mom, I would cry because I thought she was going to die. And God gave me her to enjoy her 40 more years. So don't stay with yesterday's success. You know how there are the people that stay when everything was good and live? Oh, look at that picture. I didn't have any wrinkles. I didn't have a stomach, a fat belly. I had a rear end. Well, oh, that's when the kids were little and they would never fight. Paul, one of the most successful men, said, forgetting what is left behind, looking what is ahead, the high calling of Christ. Paul could have sat in that prison cell holding on to the old scrapbooks of his memories and much less stay with the disaster that happened yesterday. One thing is certain about yesterday. It is over. It's out of your reach. There's nothing you can do. Sometimes we record videos of a, of a game, a sports match, and that video is something cruel when your team doesn't win. It doesn't matter how many times you see it, you lose. Something inside of us thinks that the game could be different if we watch it with faith. But once the whistle blew, in reality, let it go. We're out of the cup. The World Cup said it's Italy. <laughs> when Maradona made a goal. We're out of the cup. We're out. This may be the most difficult thing to let go. Each one has their own cup of affliction in due time. And my job in ministry is to hold people's hands and walk with them 
Through the valley of shadows. I've done it so many times. My job is to help them walk towards the light. That's what I do every Sunday. I help you go through the valley. I'm here to tell you that the valley is not a good place to build a house. The valley of shadows is a place to pass by. Not a day to stay forever. A place to stay forever. And every extra day that you stay here is one lost day. The most important thing is to keep on walking. So don't look over your shoulder at the happiness or the sadness of yesterday. Don't stretch your neck to see what's ahead on the curve of the road because you're going to miss out on this. I remember going to theme parks like Disneyland, Universal Studios, and lots of people recording, recording a video for someone that's not there, especially Asians. They would record everything, pictures here and there. They bump into people. Instead of enjoying, they're recording it for someone who's not there. Enjoy it, man. Life is like this. Stay alive and don't worry. The Lord told me to tell you this. My name is I Am. You might say, I know that. No, 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 no. If you live in the past, it's going to be very hard because God's not there. He didn't say his name was I was. He said, I am. Uh huh. And if you live in the future, it's going to be very hard because his name is not I will be. But if you live in the present, you'll be happy because my name is I am. When? Today? Now? So the greatest good is not necessarily time, it's focus. A focused person on today can achieve more than any other person could achieve in four weeks. With focus, a parent can share an activity with a son or a daughter that will leave great and permanent memories in that child. Time without focus is losing hours of life. It's seen 24 hours of a season of I don't know what episode. Who killed your mother? By just staying in the same office for years isn't the path to productivity. The passing of time will make us older. But that doesn't guarantee you're going to be more fruitful or wiser. And I know some people might be saying, hold on a minute. God doesn't rate us by our results. He will only evaluate us by our faithfulness. Really? It's faithful to squander our precious supplies of God-given time on something that leads nowhere? How many people spent 30 years in a dead church? Hey, do you receive the sermons? No, they're boring. Is God's presence there? Nope, it's gone. Why are you there? Oh, but I'm faithful. I put the first brick. Grab your brick and get out of there. What's it worth to be faithful if you can't achieve anything? Some people have been in a ministry for years and there's barely any fruit. I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about fruit. And I've seen others. In a short time, they were able to cultivate extensive gardens, had a healthy production, abundant harvest. What's the difference? It's not only time. It's the focus. Focus where God puts you. Many young pastors came to River saying, Dante, do you have a couple of minutes? Give me a couple of tips so my church can grow. Number one, what are you doing on a Sunday here? Go to your church. No, but I'm here to learn. Learn through the internet. Come throughout the week. Don't leave your church on a Sunday. Who's there right now? I left a leader, a young leader, so he can prepare himself. With that type of focus, man, how do you think your church is going to grow? Look, I'm not going to talk about my ministry. I'm not going to say that my ministry is the best, but the minimum is being here at church every Sunday. I've never missed out on 12 years. If you're not focused, you're not going to grow. Even when we have a guest, I'm home as a host. If I invite you to my house, open the fridge, I'm going to go out walking. If I invite you to my home, I have to be there. Focus. In my youth, I invested my energy in a lot of things. And now I have to measure my energy. I have to know when, where. It's logical. 
I have to know when and where I invest my energy, and it can be the most important decision I can make in a day. If I'm not careful and conservative, my reserve of energy is wasted in some critic or useless activity. And I want to clarify something because people asked me yesterday on the social media. I learned this throughout the years. Critics are like the poor people that Jesus mentions in the Bible. You will always have them with you. <laughs> But it's not like that because they're selfish or mean, but because they're immature. Your agenda can't be managed by the crystal believers who are easily offended because you don't answer the text message or you didn't say, happy birthday, I felt in my heart to greet you. It's our responsibility to say when is enough because people's needs are never going to end. If you don't tell them how far they can go, they will, they will go to the extreme. You have to say, enough. If you don't do it, they're not going to either. And it doesn't matter how much they love you. No one, no one is going to control your focus. No one is going to control your personal and emotional health. No one is. So you're going to continue being out of focus without the energy. And one day when you're in a hospital, due to a heart attack, like what happened to many pastors, or stressed out, those same people who drained you are going to say to you, oh, you should have rest, pastor. You should take care of the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, you can't base your life on people's expectations. And it's a shame that this clarity only comes with age. It's too bad. Why am I learning this now? Why didn't I learn this when I was a kid? <laughs> I would have saved a lot of energy. Gabriel Garcia Marquez wrote a beautiful poem, which apparently comes from the mind of a puppet, of a marionette. I don't remember how it really goes, but just paraphrasing. The puppet says, this is, of course, from Gabriel Garcia Marquez. If for a moment God forgot that I'm just a rag puppet and gave me a piece of life, I would take advantage of that time as much as I could. Possibly. I wouldn't say everything that I think, but I would definitely say everything. I can. I would value things, not for what they're worth, but for what they mean. The puppet continues saying, if God gave me a piece of life like humans, I would prove to men how wrong they are to think that they stop falling in love when they grow old without knowing that they grow old when they stop falling in love. And I would give children wings, but I would let them just learn how to fly alone. I would teach every elderly person that death doesn't come with old age, but by being forgotten. And there's a fragment that I wrote in my book called Love in the Days of Facebook, a fragment that I always loved of this poem that says, if I only knew that these are the last minutes that I'm going to see you, I would say I love you. And I would not foolishly assume that you already know it. I know that there is a tomorrow and God will give us another chance to do things right. But just in case if I'm wrong, and today is all I have left, I would love to tell you how much I love you. And as Marcus says in his poem, when we're teenagers, we think we can do anything. And we can. And we do. Then the 20s is blurry. In our 30s, we dedicate ourselves to creating a family. We earn money. We ask questions. What happened to my 20s? When we're 40, we grow a belly. We have a magical double chin. Loud music bothers us. We don't understand reggaeton. We found out that one of our teenage girlfriend is now a grandmother. <laughs> and then we get to our 70s. Alone. Covered in the sheets of our bed. 
looking at Discovery Channel with low volume, asking ourselves, why don't the boys call me? And if this is familiar to you, it's because it's the lesson of Ecclesiastes. A troubled Solomon wonders, what profit does man get from working so hard in this life? I remember my mom used to watch movies from her time, from Hollywood. And every time an actor of her time reappeared, she would say, oh, how old is she? What happened to Rita Hayworth? That woman aged. I would look at my mom saying, don't you realize you too? Oh, what happened to Robert Meacham? Oh, it's he must have cancer. Oh, he's smoking a lot. No, he's growing old like she was. And today, I post a picture on my social media and they say, Hey, Dante, you're not the youth pastor anymore. You're old. I feel like saying you're right. But if you keep saying it, you're not going to have that privilege anymore. Someone is going to kill you before. And days pass by slowly, but years go by quickly. And life, life doesn't have a rewind button. It does not. You can't go back in time. Look, I know of very few examples of remorse, right? Of people regretting things. And uh, I'm talking about these lives that really didn't take advantage of the chance that they had. I don't want this to ever happen to me. Of all the stories, there's one that's very dramatic, which is the life of a great Scottish essayist, historian, Thomas Carlyle. Carlyle. Yeah, I think that's his last name. But he's an author, and he wrote eloquently, Thomas was always those type of authors or writers that would write with lots of passion. You would get inside his books and you could not stop reading. And the writer married his secretary, a lady named Jane Welsh. She was extremely intelligent, attractive. She continued to be his secretary after marriage. Well, after they got married, Jane got sick. And Thomas was dedicated to his work. And it seemed like he didn't notice how poor the health of his wife was. He was absorbed in everything he was doing. And he allowed her to continue working. But the lady had cancer. And in time, she eventually got worse and she ended up being bed rested. And although Thomas truly loved her, he realized he didn't have a lot of time to devote himself to her. He couldn't pay too much attention to her. He kept on working. After a few years, Jane passed away. The day of her funeral, it was rainy. They carried her coughing in the rain and mud to the churchyard just to bury her. And Thomas then returned to a house that suddenly felt terribly huge and empty. He went upstairs to Jane's room. He sat in that chair next to her bed. And he realized that her journal was on the night table next to the bed. He picked it up and started to read. On one whole page, she wrote one single sentence. Yesterday, Thomas spent an hour with me, and it was like touching heaven. I love him so much. For some reason, he had been too blind to see a reality that was now revealed to him with overwhelming clarity. He had been too busy to realize how much he meant to Jane. So he thought of all the times he'd been too busy in his work and ignored her. He didn't see her suffering. He didn't sense her love. 
Thomas turned the page of Jane's diary and read the words that would break his heart and he would never forget. It said, I was aware all day listening to the noise of the front door. But now it's too late, and I suppose Thomas, again, will not come to dinner. He read a little bit more, he put the book down, and he ran off the house, ran out the house. Some friends found Thomas back in the church graveyard, kneeling on the ground next to her grave, covered in mud under the rain. He had red eyes from crying, tears streaming down his face, and he was, he was shouting, if only I had known, if only I had known. After Jane's death, Thomas made little effort to write again. The historian lived about 15 more years, but he stated that he lived tired, bored, and partially excluded from everything. He ended up saying a phrase. He never wrote a book anymore. But on a piece of paper he had on a desk, he wrote a sentence, and Julio Iglesias made it famous for writing a song about it. This was written way before the Spanish singer composed a song concerning this. I forgot to live. So, my, my beloved, let's just go straight to the truth. Remember that not everyone who has died has really lived. So, if I were you, if I were in your place, I would make sure that when I have to pass away, death would surprise me being alive. Let's pray. Father, I have preached and transmitted to this army of champions, to this crib of champions, what I believe you wanted me to say to them. I've said every word precisely what you had inspired in my heart. I did not add or take away words. I can feel the Holy Spirit touching you and reaching in places that I can never. I spoke to the intellect, but the Holy Spirit has reached to the most inner being. How much the Lord loves you, my beloved. How much he loves you, my princess. You can never imagine it. How could he not love you? He has you sculpted in his hands. Otherwise, he wouldn't speak to you like he does every Sunday. I pray for everyone who's watching and are deciding to focus and redirect their lives, to simplify, to be minimalists. They're going to make their convictions be aligned with their commitments. I pray so that God would give you that wisdom. It doesn't matter how old you are. I pray for the elderly people who are watching right now. My mom would say, rags are old. But I say it with love. Our beloved old people, I honor you. I pray for those who still haven't arrived to their prime, those who are barely beginning. It doesn't matter in what moment of life you're in. The Lord says to tell you this word is so that starting from today, you would change the priorities of your life. Change the way you organize your life. I pray that the Lord would bring peace and tranquility to every continent, to every person who's watching from anywhere around the world. I pray for those who are in quarantine and lockdown, for those who are asking themselves once and again, when will this pandemic end? And independently, when it ends, I pray that the glory of the Holy Spirit would give you peace and tranquility. Those who are saying, Lord, I love to know you. I want to help you so you would accept Jesus in your heart. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist, Jew, Catholic, Jehovah Witness. It doesn't matter if you're an Adventist or if your parents are Christian. The Lord tells me to tell you today, you can make a personal decision of saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Save me and my family. Do you really want to be saved? Do you really 
want to leave a legacy? Do you really want to leave a mark in the hearts of those who are around you? Well then, you need to receive Jesus in your heart. Say with me, Lord, come into my life. Come on, say it. Forgive me for my sins. And write down my name in the book of life. Amen. That's it. Nothing else to add. If you were here and you wanted to be baptized, we would baptize you, period. How the Lord loves you. How could he not love you? I sense that there are lots of people on the other side in tears, and that's wonderful because tears drain the pain of the heart. You need to let it go. Cry like a man. Cry like a woman. Because tears are meant to be seen. They're a gift from the Lord. And that's why tears come from our eyes so that people can see us cry and know that we're purifying ourselves. The Lord loves you. I pray for all those who, starting from today, are going to understand and comprehend that life has no rewind button. Amen and amen. My beloved, thank you for being there. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for praying for our church and all those who form part of the army of the living Lord. Of course, thanks to everyone who is waiting for the reopening of the River Arena. It's going to be a big celebration. The Word of God will continue every Sunday. And besides, everything that's coming. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it's everyone or no one. Is there any other way? See you next Sunday, God willing. Be strong and firm. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. And we'll see each other, God willing, within seven days. Here, once again, from the River Arena. Goodbye. God bless you. Abandonado y perdido te reconocí Tu voz diciendo menos temas Yo estoy aquí El Padre me envió por ti Y me curaste las heridas Me sanaste en mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz Algo tan grande no lo puedo comprender Oigo tu dulce voz diciéndome una y otra vez Oh, oh, oh Abandonado y perdido te reconocí Tu voz diciéndome no temas, yo estoy aquí El Padre me envió por ti Y me curaste las heridas, me sanaste mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz